evening, everyone. My name is Sister Deborah, and this is the Poetry Lounge. I am a, um, oh God. Uh, turn it off and let's start again. <laughs> okay. um, oh my God. Let's start again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Performance artist and yeah, skit writer. So I'm going to start off with um, my signature poem. Then I'll do another poem, and then I'm going to send it out to the floor. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. Okay, I'll wait. And I, I apologize for that. <laughs> so, the name of my signature piece is called The Audition. And I share this poem whenever I come out because these, this is what happened to me you know, during my time of, you know, dealing with poetry. So the audition. Next, come on little lady, keep the line moving through. You have exactly two minutes to show us what you can do. What is it that you said you did? What is it that you said you'll be doing? A poem, a dance, juggle ball, sing a song, whatever the case, just move it along. I'm a busy man and I don't have all day long. A poem, poetry, is that what I heard you say? Oh boy, another starring artist looking for a handout today. Look, little lady, poetry is a good gesture, but this is not a third grade play. We're looking for some real talent, so you should probably be on your way. Oh, just hold on a minute, mister, because I really traveled quite a ways. And the ad in the newspaper clearly states, no discrimination in any way. All I need is an opportunity, just a few minutes of your time, I am so sick and tired of being pushed and shoved to the back of every line. You see, poetry can be beautiful if you will listen with your heart, but it's people like you who won't give people like me a chance for a brand new start. Just give me, excuse me, just give me a chance, mister, excuse me, because I have been blessed in a special way. And if this poem that I read doesn't touch your heart, then I promise you I'll just be on my way. Now, why are you tearing, mister? Is it something that I happen to say? You just reminded me of when I was your age and I felt the exact same way. Nobody wanted to hear the sound of my drum. Now look at me today. Look what I've become. Get up there and read your heart out because today you are number one. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna pull out my sticks and start you off with the sound of my drum. Yes, I'm gonna give you the biggest, the loudest, the best drum roll, because you, little lady, have touched my soul. The audition. <laughs> okay. So, um, the next poem that I'll be sharing is called, If They Are Hungry, Feed Them. If they are hungry, feed them, is all you need to know. Don't concern yourself with their circumstances, because these are my children and I already know. I know who is doing what and exactly when, robbing, cheating, and stealing, committing all kinds of sins. You see, I'll deal with all of that when they finally do come in. If they are hungry, feed them. You see, my children are broken in spirit, unable to see the light. They took a turn down the wrong road and have lost their spiritual sight. All you need to remember is that two wrongs don't make a right. So if they are hungry, feed them. And no, I am not pleased with all the wrong I see. So count your own lucky stars that some of you are not dealing with me. Remember, I see in the dark and that I never sleep. If they are hungry, feed them. My children that you see begging on the side of the road, digging through trash cans, selling their souls, Sleeping on cardboards in the depth of winter's cold, look out for them, and in turn, I will bless your soul. I'm not asking you to enable, to be a doormat, nor look the other way. I simply ask you to stand in the gap, and if nothing else, pray. Pray for those who are lost and have simply gone astray. Remember, if not for the grace of God, this could be you or yours someday. For the same person, for the same spoon, upon which you measure a man, I will use the exact same way. I will use the exact same way. If they are hungry, just feed them.
Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't even think we did a sign-up sheet. Yeah. We, <laughs> all right. So who would like to come up next and share a poem with us? Anybody? Well, you're all right. Please do. Follow. I'm so sorry. Oh, good. Somebody's brave. We don't even have a sign-up sheet. Maybe. Please introduce yourself. Yes, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Albert Ruggiero, which is good because I wear the hat. <laughs> and uh, uh, I want to get to the point quickly if I can. I uh, when when my wife uh, passed in 2020, I gathered her writings and put them into a collection. And, and this, this is the collection. It represents 20 years of writing. And uh, pretty good stuff. Um, so I did that, and a lot of this is in, I made 22 of these. A lot of it is in her own handwriting, you know. And uh, that, that's good. And then I was talking to someone who said, you gotta do something. I thought about it, and I did. I published it. And, um, the result is Pearls from Tarot. And uh, the reason the pearls, because I, I uh, these are pearls, I took a picture and made it the, the page, the cover page. And I love it. I really do. I must say, it, it was truly inspirational. And uh, all that, and I've been traveling the state. I, I do an hour presentation, so I'm going to try to, I uh, found the state discussing the, the book, showing folks uh, uh, things about it, and um, selling copy here and there, but that's not what it's all about. Actually, uh, it's in libraries is, is where it's at. I think it's for the culture and for the, for a long time. So it's in, um, what kind of stuff, I won't show you. It's in 150 libraries right now, including this one. Uh, Cynthia was very nice, way back. And, uh, hey, I'm up. <laughs> good, good. Oh, I'm, I'm going to be over oh. here. I'm sorry. Okay. And so, uh, so I, uh, as I say, it's in 150 libraries, and it's ongoing. I'm running out of libraries, but it's in Massachusetts and, and Rhode Island, and going back Friday, and New York and New Jersey, but mostly Connecticut. And I met some incredible people along the way, incredible. I could do an hour just on them. I have their pictures, and uh, here's the list three pages of libraries and the people I met. And I've been fortunate, I'm always seeking publicity, and that's it's not about me. And this was an article in the Milford Magazine this, this summer, a very nice article they wrote, and all this is, if you folks can share to. This is all <coughs> on their website, which I'm going to pass out cards because you will enjoy it and have a good laugh. Uh, this is a very humorous book. And uh, lots of the last thing before I get to what I want to read, which is why you're here, I, uh, I'm, I'm presenting things all over the place. I was in Woodbury last week, uh, this is kind of a situation. And um, I'm going to Torrington, I was in Monroe. I've got three more this month in uh, May and June, and just book one in October. So I really do enjoy doing it, <clears throat> usually with a, a smart board presentation, you know, where the folks, I get the folks involved, former teacher, you understand? I said, oh, who would like to read? Oh, I was an English teacher. Oh, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> so I get that a lot, and it's wonderful. Because to get the folks involved uh, is it, everything. It's like having a very good class. You know? I also was on, uh, lastly, there is the last, Channel 12 and Channel 8. I came to the house for a wonderful interview. And all that stuff is on the website. But now to the point, and uh, I, I want to pass these out. A few folks were just... Take a card, take a card, any card, and uh, enjoy it at your leisure. So, the book is called Pearls from Carol. And um, as I said, I have a presentation which I go into and I we don't have the time here. But it's my way of honoring Carol. It's my way of uh, showing how proud I am of what she did. Uh, she was actually in uh, Reminisce Magazine twice. And I said, well, let's do more. I said, no, I've done that. You know what it's like. It's a very unpretentious person. And uh, one of the things I like to do is to encourage folks uh, to do the same. 
to, uh, if you think you have something to say, to find a way to say it. So with all that, in a very truncated version, uh, we'll begin. And uh, I, I'm going to begin with something that, uh, I shouldn't say this out loud, it's really not a poem. <laughs> there were, oh, oh the, chat, the book is divided into four, four chapters, and, uh, which you can see on the website. And uh, they are, I laid them autobiographical, potpourri, whimsy, and poetry. So there is a whole chapter on poetry, which I will read you a few things, and I think they're very funny, and we'll talk about that. But this one is kind of like an allegory, the way I see it. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a former history teacher, so uh, but I know something about literature. <laughs> and uh, it's called an emotional tea party. So grab on, because... I think this is swell. I used to use it in AP Psychology. Mm -hmm. And the kids, they like it. So here we go, if you can bear with me. It's not too long. And I kind of get choked up doing this. Like, <laughs> they have been with me throughout my life. Never invited, always controlling, and mightier than myself. This is the first time I will see them together. I will be able to observe their interactions. Some have seen each other. Others go hand in hand visiting me when they please, and leaving only when they decide the visit is over. And me, knowing, always knowing, they will visit again. The tea table is lavishly set with silver tea service, china cups, lacy linens, fragrant flowers, trays of sprinkled cookies, and little cakes with pastel icing. I have changed the seating arrangement several times. The only placard not moved is my own. At the head of the table, where I will pour and try to be polite to those I wish who were not there. Who will be the first to arrive, I wonder? My question is quickly answered as I see greed coming up the garden path. Of course, who else? She must always be first. She doesn't frighten me at all. She is the one who visits me the least, and I am grateful for that. Behind her comes confusion, not knowing which way to go, but always wanting to do the right thing. I watch her as she trips and falls, becomes disoriented, and she tries to follow the path. Next come the twins in their bright green outfits with glazing green eyes. Yes, they are jealousy and envy. They look so much alike, and yet there is a slight difference in their appearance. They will watch the others closely and never find satisfaction in who they are or what they have only and always wanting what is not theirs to have. Love comes unexpectedly next. Her starry eyes, moist with tears, will be seated with happiness and sadness. She is much stronger than most of the guests, but at the same time very tender and easily hurt. Hate is next, dragging rage and anger, chained to her scarlet garment. She comes when outrageous injustice has been done, she comes when demons laugh and get their way and leave me beaten, hopeless, and in despair. Many, many others fill the chairs around this enormous tea table. Only two are empty now. One is to my immediate right, as close to me as possible. The other is the farthest away, as I dread her coming. She is grief. She is the strongest of all. I watch her coming up the path, dragging her crippled legs pulling her deformed body inch by inch as, I f as the fear reaches over me. Her party dress is gray, her complexion is ashen, as she looks at me with yellowish eyes and remembers the sounds of wretched wailing and weeping. She rejoices as she tries to take my mind, my body, my inner soul. Stay away, grief. Drink your tea, eat your cake and go. The last guest dressed in brilliant white, is my intimate friend. Her name is Peace. She's the most beautiful. She pops in and out of my life. She's the only one I need the most. She and only she is the one I want to be with to eternity. She's the only one I embrace and beg to stay with me longer after this emotional party is ended. Thank you. Uh, that's really the only serious thing she wrote. Oh, okay. <laughs> what was the title of that again? 
It's called An Emotional Tea Party. And it is on the website if you look for it. There are excerpts and there's other stuff. And as you go through that, by the way, look at the media because I take pictures of everyone I go on to. And I, I could, people now are telling me you should write a book about those experiences. I'd have to write like her, but I, I'm thinking, you know, because uh, there's so many beautiful libraries out there. I'll read one more, then I'll stop. There, there's one uh, uh, library in uh, uh, Broadbrook, Connecticut. Anyone here Broadbrook, Connecticut? Broadbrook. But here's the thing, here's the thing. I got pictures. It's voluntary. It's completely honor code. You walk in, you walk out with a book, you will sign up. Wow. They do exist. <laughs> that is the last one. Yes, yes. So this is, uh, this is uh, I'll stop after this one and we'll see what happens because I love this. She didn't think much of it, but I have it on the front page of the website because it gets your attention. And it's called Why I'm Late. There was an elephant in my driveway and I couldn't back out the car. When I looked in my side view mirror, it warned elephants appear closer than they are. I backed out nice and easy, hoping the elephant had shrunk. We were now at a standoff, facing trunk to trunk. With the beast, I tried to reason, telling him I would be late if he didn't move his tail and all the rest of his weight. He thought this quite funny, threw his head back, tusked to the sky. Twas then we made a deal, the elephant and I. If you could just inhale and get a little thinner, when I get home tonight, I'll have you in for dinner. He flapped his ears from side to side, agreeing he would wait. There was an elephant in my driveway, and that's why I'm late. <laughs> you agree? Thank you, folks. So um, next we have, is everybody here signed up to do poetry or? Okay, so next we have um, Catherine, what about you? Are you reading tonight? Okay, you know you can read anything out of the book, if you like. Okay, I will, okay. So next we have Alder Barrel. I don't know if I'm saying oh, it right. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, that's all right. It's, it's not a common name. Uh, I am uh, workshopping uh -huh. some poems, if you don't mind. Okay. I write uh, traditional haiku style, okay. so the traditional 575. Um, but mostly I write uh, Semryu, which are haiku style poems about human experience, okay. rather than being about nature and seasons and things of that sort. Um, I have a, uh, <laughs> see, am I a little nervous? Yes, yes, always in front of people. Um, so thank you, Sister Deborah. Oh, you're welcome. Appreciate your I don't your think anybody was more nervous than me. Hosting. Yes. <laughs> um, that's two really difficult people to follow. So y'all will forgive me if this is less than, oh, no, you know. Oh, go ahead. I'm sure you, I'm sure you want to. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm going to be presenting soon in a, in a gathering that uh, I would invite any of you to be a part of. It's in New Haven. It's every month or two. It's called Chapter and Verse. And it's curated. So you submit in advance according to a theme that's been given. And the curator, the host, wonderful, um, will give you some suggestions and then invite you to come and read. So we have not only poets, but memoirists and people who write travel logs. And we even had somebody who read their, uh, a chapter of their dissertation once. Um, you know, people write nonfiction, people are working on novels. So if you're interested, um, you know, please see me and I'll hook you up. Um, but this month's theme is empty. And it's meant to uh, be used, um, what would I say, uh, loosely, loosely. So an interpretation of something that might remind you of a concept of empty. And uh, sometimes I do the, the suggested uh, topic and then think about its opposite. 
So a lot of these are a lot more, you know, kind of upbeat than just uh, emptiness would necessarily be. Although, you know, some emptiness is absolutely beautiful. And um, so I will do uh, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm asking, they're very quick, and I'll read relatively slowly. If you want it read again, please ask. But I'm asking any feedback. I love constructive criticism. So if something doesn't make sense, just keeping in mind that they're very short and that they follow the 575, five, which you won't hear in my voice, but there will be 17 syllables in each poem. Hands full of pockets, <coughs> shoes full of feet, walking the night, hoping to meet. Pardon me. Thank you. Thank you. I do have a nose and a mouth. Um, I, and I'm still being, you know, a little bit careful. Um, so hands full of pockets, shoes full of feet, walking the night, hoping to meet. That one kind of worked out in a nice little little rhythm. Um, but I've been there, so a lot of these are autobiographical. I've got plenty of plenty. Plenty of plenty is plenty for me. <laughs> and I, the, the reason this is in the uh, empty or the nothingness category is uh, if you're of a certain age, <clears throat> as I am, you might remember, I've got plenty of nothing and nothing's plenty for me. So, as it, I believe it is, yes, uh, George Gershwin. And um, we, we poets steal. I mean, let's face it, we steal. So it's not like we're all inventing new vocabulary words when we write our poetry. So we steal. So I stole from Gershwin, and feel free to steal from me if you like it. Ancestors. I am because you were. Eggs, sperm, dreams, all here now. In me. Thank you. Sometimes I don't write it, it just comes. You understand? I'm sure you do. <laughs> if it ain't yummy, if it don't jump you for joy, forget about it. <laughs> I, I should title this one, Reminder to Self. <laughs> but I've always, ever since I've lived in this part of the country, which is now 37 years, so I'm a newcomer to New England by New England standards, um, I've wanted to use forget about it in a poem. So you are the first to ever hear this poem. And then one last one. Sometimes I pretend to need only what I have just to feel wealthy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Come see me after if you want to know about chapter and verse, and I invite every one of you. You would be more than welcome. Okay, thank you very much. That was lovely. So next we're going to have um, Catherine Longyear. She'll be coming up reading the piece. Let's give her a hand as she comes. Mrs. Worrywart. Poor Mrs. Worrywart died the other day. She was so kind. She was so thoughtful. Too bad she worried herself away. She worried about her family. She worried about her friends. She worried about everything. She worried to no end. She worried about the birds and the bees. I mean, she worried about the birds in the trees. She even worried about the fish in the sea. Poor Mrs. Worry War worried about strangers. She worried about you and me. We all tried to warn her that all this worrying would do her no good, that it would only deprive her of enjoying her own life the way God meant that she should. Poor Mrs. Worry War, we might as well have been talking to a drifting 
piece of wood. Oh. I think I know this lady. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Okay. So next we have Laura. Okay. Come on out. <laughs> Thank you. Let's give her a hand as she comes. <laughs> She's so special. <laughs> I used to be in show business, so I know how to make an entrance. You know? uh, except that, you know, the poetry that I brought this evening, most of my poetry, I didn't bring my funny stuff. And some of it is uh, serious, and also I have a tendency to write in sort of a free verse, but with internal rhymes, so that it's not always at the end of the line, you know, not a typical Shakespearean or... Um, just not not so traditional, but somewhat traditional. So I'm working on this piece. I've changed it a number of times, and I've been concerned about the environment. So this is called A Legend at Runner's Tree. Dear friend, let me rest my hand against your crenulated skin. Let me catch my breath. You breathing out, me breathing in, our symbiotic bond without formal consecration or useless conversation. When the dinosaurs left, mine crawled out of the slime, some bereft of their gills, flew into your arms, others willful, then erect, survived on your foliage and fruit. Until nearly all our dreams were shattered by the heat no one could yet speak of. As the, as the sediments later told, your resilient forebears pressed themselves down into the cold underground. My ancestors scattered, inventing language, commerce, and the arts and a love that barely mattered. Somehow, we are both still here. You, part of the verdant global lungs that buoyed me up on my run today. You, still breathing out to such good effect. Me, taking a moment to reflect and catch your breath your friend. Did that work? Did it work? I mean, that's, I've been working on this a lot, and I changed it. And this, I think, is the most complete sense of the poem that I have. So if you think there's something not quite there, please tell me. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad it wasn't such a bummer. Okay. So this one is called Exigent Habits. <clears throat> Beauty is my weakness. I need to see the flowers before me when I wake and sit to eat. I need to read the poets before I sleep. Otherwise, I'd rather sleep than wake to a world without them. I need to muse about the ancients and their discovery of the first word. Imagine how the first flute mimicked the bird. Then how the rhymes that married the music in the trees became the songs that got us all off our knees. These are habits I will never break. They are exigent and essential and have become my strength. I'm on a roll. <laughs> okay, this one is called The Omen. What fire is singing in the veins of the bloody leaf? It's an omen of fires to come. The siren's song is long gone. There is not enough water or fire to atone for what we have done. Mm. It reads pretty good in Italian, too, which I translate. <laughs> Thank you. And this one I'm also working
working on. It's, I call it evolutionary glitch. Even sensible me has known beyond the time zone, across any distance, when a kindred spirit has battled the reaper and lost. Yet given a good day when the earth is fresh with planting and daps have kissed the breeze, some feel obliged to fall on their knees in a sanctified place. I race my gratitude down to the sea to make out the curve of the earth and welcome my ghosts dancing toward me in the froth and laughter of spring's first eventide. Mm. Is that okay? That's kind of a draft. That's it, that's all I got. But thank you so much for your appreciative applause. Thank you so much. I thought it'd be a downer there. Thank you. Thank you again for that wonderful poetry. Next, we're going to call up Margaret Sawyer. Hey, hey You're welcome. <laughs> this is from um, a collection called The Inner Shore. We are the inner shore. We are now the open ocean. And I think that's also ourselves. Right? So, low tide, down in dreams and tidal as my one window view of sea marsh, whose slow ebbing on a bed like mine drifts soft with water and lifting grass. One with the light winds running green through the leaves and gold shining halos of meadows. Remembrance goes rippling and wasting. Old thoughts, a land song streaming, unwinding, unwound, and all its particulars, just shadows, sliding slowly seaward. And still they rise to frolic, so careless of all that, duets of white butterflies, drawing up in their amorous spirals the double helix of small persistent dancing that anchors the world. Mm. Now, I spend a good deal of time on Cozy <coughs> Beach, so this, mm. listening to Cozy Beach, Tides of old boat shells rattle against the breakwater. Beached forever, their pink privacy bleaching in the sun. Erasure listens to itself. All their crumbling architectures, light chatter. It's an echo, the lingering conversation of sentence simulated. The calcium chorus, its song, a dirge of rock and bone that rolling on the tide's rough tongue rattles its own skeletons. Sanding their ears, splitting their seams, and casting them out to the will of wind and water. To the enormous ellipse of throbbing sea fold, whose winnowing current forces them back onto the tumbled earthwork of their lives. Their lost cities piled, polished like gemstones, and their salt-sown temples drowned. Thank you. Okay, let's give her another hand, and thank you so much for sharing that. Next, we have Sterling Davenport. Let's give her a hand. Thank you. Um, my mom uh, 
died last summer, well, last spring, and it was her 97th birthday, mm -hmm. and she always loved my poetry. So mm -hmm. I put a little collection together for her, for her mm -hmm. 97th birthday, mm -hmm. and um, did some illustrations, just little, little line drawings and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll read a couple of these. There's, I did them in several sections, like, um, you know, uh, seeking the muse, embracing family, talking with trees, loving, traveling the world, contemplating life, and um, tunneling to the light. <laughs> so I don't know, maybe I'm, I just sort of skip around here. I think the first one I'm going to read is called The Philosopher's Room. This is about my mother's brother, my uncle, Matt, my favorite uncle, who is very eclectic and strange. <laughs> A bit eccentric, too. My uncle's, my uncle's room, musty with unwashed clothes, books stacked everywhere, smelling of age and wonder, psycho-cybernetics, Paralandra, ancient Welsh, the dialect of frogs, Homer, Oscar Wilde, Persian grammar, the last question, Lao Tse, voyage to Mars, plants on the windowsill, musky cats curled on the unmade bed. My uncle's bureau was mysterious, like my father's. In the drawer, clean handkerchiefs, a bone shoehorn, a playbill decorated with dancers in silhouette, men's underwear with strange pockets, and on the divan, a plush satin triangular pillow, deep burgundy aroma on my cheek. The Chinese folding screen painted with cranes and broad-leaved plants separated me from the cluttered desk in the corner royal typewriter with its sticky keys against the ivory paper, window facing toward the garden, the smokehouse and the ice house no longer used, vines trailing up the wall, edged above the sill, the smell of oaks and the call of a crow. My uncle's room above the conservatory, playground for cats, great ideas and ancient philosophies, new sciences and old sentience. As I could see, a man could live very easily with unwashed clothes, old books, and cats. Mm. <laughs> um, I think I'll read next one that um, it's, it's kind of a love poem in a way. It's about um, my, my son and, um, and his father. His father and I separated, and then we sort of thought about getting back together. So this is about meeting him and, and how that went. <laughs> it's called Fences. We've crossed the void to meet again, succumbing to our need. Your graceless stance reveals your pain. My voice betrays my greed. And yet, when faced with you, I freeze, afraid of my desire. I sculpt a smile on, flirt and tease to cover up the fire. You match my mood and love and sport, your face masked as my own. We spend the precious time so short as if it were on loan. What is it that we fear so much? The past for which we grieve? Or is it just the loving touch of someone who might leave? I try to hear with open heart your halting, honest words. Yet feelings fly into the dark like apprehensive birds. Sad memories linger like a song made of scars that never died. You've been running far too long, and I'm too proud to cry. Mm. 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 Um, I have just one more short one, and this is kind of weird, but um, I was listening to NPR on, in the car, and I got so enraptured with these people. They were scientists. Um, they were um, uh, astrophysics um, you know, professors talking about the theories of the universe. I actually pulled over the car you know, and stopped because it was so fascinating. I think for the first time in my life, I actually understood what they were talking about. Okay. So um, it, it seemed very romantic to me. So I wrote this poem. It's called String Theory in Paris. <laughs> what was it again? String Theory in yeah. Paris. The night sky invites the dreamer to decide if there's an axis or plane, if gravity rules in all gal galaxies or chaos in particles reign. Do parallel worlds exist? And does time share a second hand? 
Do we merely disembark changing planes to a different land? Or is it multilinear, housed in a deep black hole? Do we swim in celestial music, composed by an oversoul? String theory displays its romance with all the beguiling zen of a view from the Pont Neuf watching the stars and the Seine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I haven't decided yeah. whether to publish this. I just, I just made it for myself. Oh, oh, it doesn't look like what happens if somebody says, okay, I dare you to write a poem about string theory and care. <laughs> there you oh, go. 30 minutes. <laughs> wow. wow. Hi everybody, uh, it's Cynthia from the library. So um, I'm going to read um, just a short um, little stanza from uh, Song of Myself by Walt Whitman. Um, I, I love Walt Whitman. Uh, I mean, I, I'm interested in his philosophy of transcendentalism and how he sort of believed that, you know, everything was connected in the world. And um, his poetry inspired my own poetry, actually. But I'm just going to read this short, um, this short uh, stanza from Song of Myself. The spotted hawk swoops by and accuses me. He complains of my gab and my loitering. I, too, am not a bit tamed. I, too, am untranslatable. I sound my barbaric yap over the roofs of the world. The last scud of day holds back from me. It flings my likeness after the rest and true as any on the, sh on the shadowed wilds. It coaxes me to the vapor in the dusk. I depart as air. I shake my white locks at the run runaway sun. I effuse my flesh in the eddies and drift it in lacy jags. I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You will hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep me encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for sharing that with us. So, um, this is one of the poems out of my book. Um, most of my poems are spiritual. Um, you'll hear me mention God and just about all the work that I do because I know all things come from Him. So the name of this piece is called Holy Ground. I went before the King today. Yes, I kneeled on holy ground way upon the mountaintops with angels all around. You see, everyone, I needed to speak to my father, the king, about my many hurts and my many letdowns. Here I was allowed to enter into his presence where all truths could be found. Everyone, this was a time for worship. This was a time for prayer. This was a time to pour out my heart of time to incline my ear. I spoke to the holiest of holies, and then I listened for his words. He told me that I was his precious daughter, and that man's judgment I did not deserve. He spoke to me about man's tongue, and how it serves as a two-edged sword, how it can rip someone apart, leaving that person bitter and tart, bringing more pain to an already broken heart. For he said, no man is the father, for not one can stand in his place, for on that day of judgment, he would meet them face to face, so my message to each of you is to always be compassionate and to always be kind. Think on the things that Jesus Christ would do, and you will always have peace of mind, holy ground. Mm. Oh. Nice. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the book says, "Windows to My World," a collection of poetry depicting real life for many, and that's a lot of what I write, real life 
put on the stories. So this one is called Dear Daughter. And I wrote this when I turned a certain age and I felt like nobody was understanding me. So, Dear Daughter, now that I'm getting older, I wish to share a few things with you. I thought I had at least 10 more years for this heart-to-heart -heart conversation, but apparently my time is due. Mm. Things like family secrets, the family will, family heirlooms, and the real reason why no one was ever allowed to go in Uncle Johnny's room. <sighs> Boy, I feel as if I have gone through some kind of metamorphosis within the last three years, and that sadly, you may possibly go through too. You have always been my little girl, the apple of my eye, and I would hate for the things that are happening to me to happen to you. So this letter is my way of forewarning and hopefully protecting you. I guess it's all part of life that every woman must go through. Most people refer to it as a change. I call it like it is, outright insane. What other reason could there be for sweating, forgetting, and on top it off, now sneezing and wetting? Everything I've learned in life is now going against the grain. I find myself walking around in circles because many times I cannot wrap the simplest task around my brain. You know, when I can't find my purse and constantly misplacing my shoes, keys in the refrigerator, changing my favorite lifetime color from purple to blue, it's like, who the heck are you? Daughter, I want you to listen and I want you to take heed in hopes to pre-prepare you for this season in your life when you too may make decisions that are far from right. You see, the hardest words for me to utter from my lips is that my mind does not function like it used to and that I no longer feel equipped. I used to be so sharp, I used to be so organized. My mind used to be full of wonderful ideas. Now I just wanted to normalize. I would like everybody right now to follow me inside of my mind and take a look. What goes on in my mind is something like a scene from a Harry Potter book. <laughs> Every tree looks the same. Every branch calls my name. The birds look like dragons and the clouds look like flames. The bottom line is there are days when I don't know how to maneuver inside my own brain. Your dad thinks I'm crazy and your brother suggests a shrink. But I'm asking you, as my daughter, to at least throw me a believer's life jacket before you two deem mom on the brink. Anyways, today the sun is shining and I'm feeling pretty good. I think I'll go um, do a little shopping, get my nails done, treat myself to lunch, appreciate what I have in life, and thank God that I could. Oh. Dear God. <laughs> so next, we're gonna call back up Mr. Rogerio. Come up and share some poetry with us. All right. Give him a hand as he comes back up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, I'm, I'm reading through these and trying to decide what is the best, most apropos. I, I just kind of everything brings back memories. So we'll start with something. I'm really not myself today. That's right. I'm really not myself today. I can't imagine why. I smile at all who pass my way and never sulk or sigh. I don't feel old, don't feel the cold. My aches and pains I bear. No one needs to shout at me now that I can hear. My vision has returned to me and I can even bend my knee. And oh, I'm not so crotchety. Can't you see, could it be? I'm really not myself today. That's the day I passed away. Oh, <laughs> That's a, that's a heavy, that's a heavy. Uh, yeah. wow. Sounds of summer past. We'll, we'll Croaking frogs beneath my bedroom window. Alvin, Audrey, Paul, Miss Otto's call for dinner. The echoing clickety-clack of kick that can be uh, under a dim street light. Kick the can under a dim street light. Creaking, crocking, rocking chairs on the front porch. The ice man's tongs, crackling chunks and silk slivers. Women in white aprons, snapping green beans, dropping into a metal colander. Squealing children running through a rubber garden hose. The ragman's horse clippity-clopping across the street. Slippery salamanders splashing in a stagnant pond. The ice man's 
bells, the ice cream man's bells, wait up, wait up. These are the songs, the, the sounds of summer past. And uh, yes. I can relate to some of them. Um, okay. Uh, in my, it is called Where Is Your Twin? In my mirror lives my twin. She smiles back at me when I look in. We are 12 and full of fun. When I look back, we're 21. I'm jealous of the face I see. She's much prettier than me. I look again, now 33. A serious face is what I see. Then again at 42, where's the twin that I once knew? I never noticed she had gray hair. Being twins just isn't fair. She looks quite old at 56, a face a surgeon couldn't fix. In my mirror lives my twin. Glad I'm not her when I look in. <laughs> so much, so much here. She wrote, actually wrote a poem about a piece of lint, but I'm not going to read it. I, this is kind of funny, and there's lots of reasons. I love, it's called I love, dot, dot, dot. Little green burrows, torrid and shy, timid and shy, wake up. Jacks and Jennies with dark lashed eyes. At a country fair, I read a sign. One burrow's for sale. He could be mine. With long ears, he listened as I told him the plan. He lived in my backyard, and I'd call him Dan. I with a shovel, the burrow just played. He chewed on the house, he hawed and brayed. An angry neighbor called to say, Get rid of that donkey now, today. He knocked down the fence and ate all my grass. I love my burrow, but he's a pain in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> and she really did like burrows, and there's a whole story. Uh, this is a, perhaps I'll stop with this, and there's so much. This is a true story, and it's longer than I want to read, but here we go. Mama put a five in my mitten. Mama put a five inside my mitten on a cold and snowy night so long ago. Dad is running late today, tonight, and I must tend the stew. If we're to have a Christmas tree, I need to count on you. Go down the hill and take two rights. You'll see the man with the Christmas lights. Strung all along the trees. Get the best a five will bring. Don't let him sell you some skimpy thing. Not too big, but not too small. Be sure the top is nice and tall so we can place on our shiny stars. I took my sled, I took some rope, my young heart was full of hope that I would buy the perfect tree for my mama, dad, and me. The five inside my mitten seemed to cut into my hand, so I pulled the empty sled across the snowy land. I saw the lights, I saw the trees, and then again, I saw the man. Thick woolen cap, a heavy coat, a ragged glove on just one hand. Business not so good this year, he bellowed to another. The fear inside of me rose, but then I thought of mother. Pick the best a five will bring. Don't let him sell you some skimpy thing. The smell of spruce, the smell of pine made me want them all. Just then, I saw the perfect tree. Not too short, not too tall. I squeezed the five, then I knew I must be thrifty. How much is this one, I asked the man. Twas then that he growled, 650. I looked at his dark beard with the snow upon it as he yelled, What do you want? What do you want? Too much, said I, for such a tree. It's not that nice, I said. I'll take six and not a penny less. That was when he sighed. I have five inside my mitten. My mother put it there. I think this is worth no more. I hope you will see that's fair. Take this nice one, he grabbed the tree as his yellow needles fell. <laughs> now his turn to lie. But truly, I could tell. I slipped a warm five from my mitten. Give me the five, he snarled. Take the tree. He reached for his box on the shelf, stuck it in the five, stuck it in the fire, and said to me, tie it on yourself. So home I trudged with my fine tree. Mama would be so proud of me. And that was as that, and that, and that she was as dad came through the door. Where'd you get that perfect tree? He looked at me. She smiled at me. I'll tell you, dad. Of the night I've had, I stood there, oh, so smitten. It all began tonight, Dad, when Mama put a five inside my bed. Yeah. Oh. That's a true story. I, I should say, are all are these stories, that story true? Said, well, but that that was true. And so, uh, uh, Lord, I have so many here, but I want to lead you with something. 
We'll go to the back here. <laughs> uh, Which was her favorite? Did she have a favorite? That's a great question. Uh, no one ever asked me that. I can't say. I'm sure she must have had things she liked better than others. And there, there was one that's, uh, I saw it as I was passing here, but I could, will never take your time. That's on the, uh, it's on the website. On the website, uh, the, the, when you look at the icon, there's media and uh, blog and all that. If you go to blog, on the bottom, number three, there's actually uh, uh, me videoing Carol doing a presentation. And you can see her reading, which must have been her favorite story. Uh, it, it's, it's quite good. It's about Barney the Beggar. Uh, uh, this is called Hello, Hello. She lives in a corner of my room and never disagrees. If I say blue is red or red is blue, she concurs. This is true. She's, she sounds like me when I am mad, cries like me when I am sad, laughs like me when I am glad. Best damn friend I ever had. I say hello, hello, she greets. If I lie, she will repeat. She never fails things, she never fails things the way I do. When I have nothing to say, she is silent too. My echo. <laughs> so, so, I thank you for this, uh, this wonderful opportunity and uh, there's so much more that I, and I, I have them all lined out here, but I say, I don't know about this one or that one. But, uh, uh, okay, we'll leave you with this one. Because uh, surely I could never write this way. This is called The Snow Lady. Now here we go. The sounds of laughter breaks winter's gloomy silence and draws me to my front window. Directly across the street, Maria and her grandchildren are building a snowman. I join the laughter realizing the sculpture is not a man at all, rather a very curvaceous young lady. On her head sits a flowered Easter bonnet, giving hope for spring. The snow, snow lady melts into a memory as Maria prepares her flowers bed, lying, laying the wheelbarrows of fresh mulch across the street, I'm doing the same. A blur of yellow forsythias wink at lilac buds. Soon the lilacs will bloom, releasing a lavender fragrance fragrance throughout the neighborhood. Summer finds me watering pale and pink fuchsia-colored impatience. Maria is tending her begonias. She waves and crosses the street to chat. I ask about her grandchildren, who are grown now. I mention a snow lady they built many years ago. Through teary eyes, we decide to talk about the flowers. Red and orange leaves quickly turn to rust. Autumn will carpet the lawns, and raking begins. Winter will soon arrive. I am drawn to the front window where I reminisce to the sound of laughter and the snow lady wearing an Easter bonnet. <laughs> I don't want to keep going, but I could. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, thank you again. Next, we're going to call up Dee Dee Baker. She's new to the Poetry Lounge, so let's give her a hand. So, hi everybody and the internet. Um, never read um, my poetry out loud before. It was kind of an impulse thing, so I'm um, not really sure how to introduce it. But um, yeah, it's been a weird few months, and so I can just write a stream of consciousness thing about it. And so um, here we go. All right. Thanks. <laughs> okay. So I was afraid of the dark, and then I realized I was the only thing in it, hand in hand into it like an old friend. I've been the scariest thing here, chasing myself in circles around it till I crossed within the tree line, and the forest floor rose to crown thy head. I've been afraid of all my life, of every night, because I've been the only one that's been strong enough to rise and claim it. And that's what I got so far. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. I gotta go back to work. So, oh, you cannot trip on that chair. Hi. I tell you, I understood that poem. Thanks for sharing. Yes. Thank you. That's great. Okay, 
next we're going to have Catherine come back up, share something with us. Okay. Were you coming up, Kat? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, do you want me to call someone while you're looking? Okay, this next one is called One String, <clears throat> S-T-R-I-N-G, One String. And that's all some of us got, half the time that's all tangled and balled up in a knot. <clears throat> Sometimes I sit and cry on my tear-ridden cot about what I have and what I have not. A real pity party just for me. I've invited no one, and no one can stay. Why do I keep throwing this same party while still holding on to this one little string? I'm like the woman in the commercial who has fallen and can't get up. I'm like a butterfly someone has captured under a paper cup, not allowing myself to spread my wings, not allowing myself to step up and sing, not treating my own self like a human being, still, I hold on to this one string. Can anyone out there hear me? Because I'm really screaming out. I realize that it's in the form of a whisper, but damn it, I need some help. My skies are gray when they should be blue. Some people have nothing, not even a pair of shoes. I have my string and I should be grateful. For that, I should stop crying, I should stop complaining, I should get up and give my own self a clap while holding on to this one string. Strange about this one string, sometimes in a strong, as it's as strong as a rope, other days it's like a piece of silk, offering me no hope. But I've come to, come to understand that it's all a part of the plan. Either I throw in the towel or I boldly stand, still holding on to this one string. For those of you who have one string, the time has come for you to stand and sing. Right before the curtain comes down, put on a smile and toss that frown. This is your time and you're in the right place to show the world the beauty behind that face. If you have one string, don't let it go. Embrace it, nourish it, and watch that baby grow. One string. That's bringing tears in my eyes. <laughs> Taurus and the Pleiades. 
Wow. <laughs> After that, I was on my own. But it was okay because it got me started. So Aldebaran is okay. <laughs> a, a chosen. Oh, name. okay. So do you have anything else you'd like to come up and oh, share? Oh, honey, we could be here all night. Well, you can give us something. You can give us something. Oh, my goodness gracious. I'm, not, I'm so not um, prepared, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. I'm, sure. teachers, but I have a brother at home that I have to get back to because he needs me, mm-hmm. and I promised mom on her deathbed that I would take care of him, so that's my job. So this poem is called A Song Begun. A song begun before its end will all my sorrows heal and mend, for when it soars my spirits lift, and life is once again a gift. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so Also do this in um, West Haven and in New Haven. So. Poetry Lounge. Yep. All right. Um, next we have. Uh, I guess. Oh. Yes. Come on. Come on. Come on. Okay. Paul Deveron. Okay. Come on. Paul Deveron. Yes. Thank you. The next time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I guess I should have been sitting there preparing, but oh well. We'll see what comes out. Um, I I do have some scribbling here that. I'm hoping to turn into poetry, but I was I was also busy while everybody else was reading, writing down words and phrases, and so um, if you ever hear me read poetry again, maybe you'll hear some of your own words in my in my poems. You never know. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, what would I like to share? You see, it's a mess. It's a wreck. It's a complete wreck. But. Um, Oh, just like poetry. <laughs> just, just like poetry. It's a complete mess, and then it so gels. <laughs> and if it only gels for me and everybody else goes, that's okay, too. Yeah. It's therapeutic, right? Um, okay, well, here's one that's kind of thematic, given ha- how much of this has come into our uh, ears tonight. Mother used to say, empty is as empty does. I try to stay <laughs> and that's, that is ripped right out of um, Forrest Gump. Stupid is as stupid does, Forrest. <laughs> oh, that, was, that was an all-time great film for so many reasons. Okay, now this is my interpretation of something I actually saw on Facebook. It was one of those memes, once somebody did it, everybody was doing it, and they were filming it and they were posting it and so maybe you've seen it. Dangling the sheet, I stand behind it, step aside, drop it. My dog freaks. <laughs> well, what I can't write in 17 syllables is that where they're standing, it's in a, it's in a doorway, right? Uh-huh. And then they step like into the bathroom. Uh-huh. So the dog only sees, oh, my human's behind that sheet. And then 
And every single dog, I kid you not, just goes, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's probably cruel, but it's hilarious. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, my. This is, um, another thing I saw on Facebook is something that a, a young poet friend of mine uh, posted. She's in chapter and verse, so she often reads. If you come, you'll probably hear her poetry. And, um, and she's really exceptional. She's one of those young people that you just know is going places if she continues. Mm -hmm. um, so she was chosen to be one of a group of people that read last week on, I think it was National Poetry Day. Day, which kind of prepares us for National Poetry Month, which it is, by the way. Happy National Poetry Month, and thank you for having this as a celebration. Um, so she was reading at a branch library in New York City, and I didn't tell her. I just got on the train. I canceled everything, got on the train, and went and gave myself a day in the city. And, um, and, and she was just like, <laughs> I was afraid it was going to keep her from being able to even read, but no, she was fine. Um, then she posted, there was a, a request, I guess, because there was a poem called A Poem for a Girl or something like that. And she posted it and said, well, every girl should have a poem written for, for them. Any volunteers? Like, write a poem for me. Little does she know. Um, she's going to get a, a couple of them. Um, poets, words. Lacking, deceit, devoid of pretense, offer sanctity. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's not a, an exaggeration, thank you. And I will read you the other one um, that I wrote for her. Whoops, can't uh, talk and push uh, numbers to open the phone at the same time. There we go. I did write a, a, another one for her that, um, again, I'm working, this is a workshop for me, and if anybody hears a word that you don't like or you would change or, um, you know, you don't think I should ever read in public again, I mean anything, anything, I'll, I'll take anything, really. I appreciate it, it just means you're listening. Okay, so this, this, this one is also uh, based on um, the poem for a girl and every girl should have a poem written for her. And to me, at 68, she is a girl, although she's certainly a young woman. Um, this is called For You, Sitara Girl. Empties opposite, abundant, bursting, complete your poetic words. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so full of chicken skin. I can't wait till she hears it. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is a, such a privilege for me. Thank you. Excellent. I'll come more prepared for encores next time. <laughs> right. So next we have Laura. Are you reading again? Oh, that, this was Laura. Oh, Laura. Yeah. Okay. She did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, Margaret? Are you reading anything else? Okay, Sterling? Okay. Can read another one? Yeah. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, please. Uh, I'm not sure which one to read, but maybe I'll just open up to the first thing I see. Just read them both. Um, okay. Uh, I lived in India for about 11 months, and um, I was stationed up in the northern part, which is you know near the Himalayas and really cool. And then I went down to the southern part to visit some friends, and I wrote this one um, from there, missing my friends in the north. In Bombay, the alien is me amid the noise, the heat, the multi-layered crush of thoughts like high-rise buildings pressed into the yielding earth. A thin crust of concrete like a lid on history of decades rhymed in coded music Syllables of memory for deities to play. I cannot breathe deeply enough to reach the cool realm that links me to the Northland. My arms are pinned by time amidst an agonizing circus of graceful creatures speaking in liquid tongues, 
delineated by the absence of monsoon rather than the presence of the warm breeze. I cannot breathe deeply enough to smell the incense of Tibetan juniper sending threads of sacred smoke like kites from deep within my soul. And suddenly, your scent upon my pillow, a mere impression furled around the fingers of my heart's mind, the music like a river underneath. I press my ear to the sheet and listen. I was missing somebody. <laughs> <laughs> that took me back to an, an exact replica, uh, except it wasn't in the other world, that I was just like, just like that. Me. Um, this poem I wrote when I was, um, hmm, 22? So it's like 50 years ago. Um, or more than 50 years ago. But it was for, um, it was for my, uh, I didn't write this for now. I believe I wrote this for my son's father um, when I was still pregnant. It's called The Gentle Penetrating Wind. If I could command the sky, I would send you a gentle wind mm -hmm. to ease your mind and slow the pulse of awful concentration, scatter the contradiction, and send you back to a time when you walked upright in your youth, not knowing what was to come when freedom still had many faces and you thought you had worn all your masks. And I would send you a penetrating wind to clear your senses of the scars of other people's dreams and needs and warnings and plant a vision in your restless mind that you woke up and found yourself where you wanted to be, where all the things you feel and all the things you know come together until they sing and the blood would pound in your heart like a song that had seen a thousand years of living. Well, I'm back. Uh, <laughs> just a few things in passing to leave you with some flavor of it. This is called Old Enough. My bedtime curfew was extended at the age of 10. At last, I was allowed to watch Ralph Edwards host a TV program called This Is Your Life, <laughs> sponsored by the Hazel Bishop Lipstick Company. I know where this is going. I didn't recognize many of the guests and waited patiently for the commercials. A model with long blonde hair and ruby lips held a jeweled lipstick case as the invisible audience ooed and odd. I desperately wanted that lipstick. I tried to get enough courage. I looked toward my mother. The effort was wasted. As the clairvoyant answered my asked question, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. I resented needing consent. The answer was always, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. The thing that aging possesses was taken forever as I listened to, I'm sorry, you cannot drive until you're 16. I'm sorry, you cannot vote until you're 18. I'm sorry, you cannot marry without parental consent until you are 21. Time passes at a faster rate when one becomes the consenter. Too soon, the automatic doors open at the senior center where I found myself applying for membership. I filled out the form only hoping to hear, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. No. Oh my God. Instead, instead, the obliging bookkeeper handed me the official Joy of Aging card and smiled and said, that's a lovely shade of lipstick you're wearing. Oh. I, you know where this is going. I fumbled through my purse, pulled out my jeweled case and beamed, it's Hazel Bishop and I'm old enough. Oh. <laughs> Uh, there's one here, it's a little long about Sylvia, I, 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 I won't, this, this is short and funny. Goodbye, Sandra D. As a teenager in the 50s, getting ready for a date was an ordeal. It meant getting out the umbrellas. Not that I feared rain, in fact, I would never carry an umbrella on a date, it just wasn't cool. 
Instead, I use the umbrellas to shape my horsehair crinolines. Using a long wooden spoon, I stirred sugar into hot water and soaked the crinolines in the mixture. Then I laid open over the open umbrella. As they dried, the sugar stiffened the fabric. Getting dressed, I slipped a full circular skirt over the stiff crinolines. I tied my hair in a ponytail with a sheer pink scarf and giggled, well, look at me, I'm Sandra D. It was sure, I was sure my date would be pleased. Years have passed, as did Sandra D. I no longer date because my husband may not approve. Today, when I tie my hair in a ponytail and frown, I frown and say, well, look at me, I'm Willie Nelson. <laughs> and that, one last word. Well, where is your twin? Did I read this already? Yes. Oh, <laughs> it struck me. Well, well, well. Uh, so, <clears throat> there's so many that. Uh, ten things in a closet. <laughs> My winter closet is such a sight, not only coats, but a big flashlight. The batteries are probably dead, a fedora hat from my husband's head, a leather glove without a mate, too much tis mat to find its match we'll have to wait. Until the spring when I can clean, oh, a scarf I haven't seen, umbrella hanging on a hook, and yes, this is my pocketbook, a box of light bulbs on the shelf above, and the old blue sweater that I love. Uh, I sense, I sense, uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. And, uh, this is, uh, the science, these are all assignments. So, write letter to a 10-year-old self. That was his sign. And this will be the last one. Dear Carol, happy 10th birthday. It's hard to believe you will be going to the fifth grade. The red boots and matching umbrella were one of your favorite birthday gifts. And because I know you so well, I know you will never want to get, take them out and get them wet. When it rains, you will just close the umbrella and keep it under your coat. The pristine boots will also stay dry as you walk home barefooted. Everything must be perfect for you. I know you so well, you will not change. You will plan every step of your life and anxiety will make you move too fast. I must admit you are a responsible child and that will continue. But unfortunately, your perfect plans will crumble. The world is not a perfect place and you will all too soon realize this. Listen, listen carefully to Miss K, your new fifth grade teacher, uh, as she has her class recite, the Lord is my shepherd every day. Mm -hmm. The 23rd Psalm will make you understand that there is a perfect place. Mm -hmm. Slow down, Carol. Enjoy your unperfect life on earth. And please, little, please, 10 year old, stay with me always. You are so much fun. Mm -hmm. With love from your adult self. Mm -hmm. Carol. Thank you for this time. Thank you. His purpose, God created the world for his glory to be a beautiful masterpiece adorned by all, but mere men have turned it upside down. In other words, it's flawed, not by God, but by man's foolish wars and laws. Amen. Okay. So, all right. So, I'm going to share this last one. Um, this is kind of a, a real poem. Things like this happen to many people. And this is a woman whose life has been interrupted as a child. It's called Life Interrupted. So, this is a story about Dana. Dana is an adult child who shares this, her story about her life being interrupted as a child and the major effects that this interruption has had on her throughout her years. Can everyone please give Dana a hand for her willingness to come and share her message with others that you are not alone? Let's give Dana a hand. Dana? Dana! Oh, excuse me, everyone. She tends to be a little shy. 
I'll be right back. I'll just have to go and get them. <laughs> Come on, Dana, you can do this. Well, Dana, you did promise that you would share today, and they are expecting you. Don't worry, you'll be fine. You're going to be just fine. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dana Stolen Soul, and I am a 62 years old. When I was just a little girl, my mind was in a terrible accident. Someone crashed into it, destroyed my very soul. Yes, my mind got damaged at the tender age of five, so is it any wonder that even today, I still cannot make a decision, I still cannot decide, I can't decide what I want to be or where I want to go, so I just continue to go around in circles, circles, very often feeling quite confused. But again, let me just try to decipher, try my best to explain the detriment that lives in my mind, taking place over and over, until my ripe old age of nine. You see, when you're small, normal small things happen to you. Like you fall and you skin your knee. This you can deal with a band-aid, you see. But when you're small and unnatural big things happen, like getting pinned under a fallen redwood tree, you don't know what to do. You've been violated, desecrated, soiled through and through. Does anyone understand what I am saying? Have you ever had a man tree? fall on you. Anyways, when this gigantic thing happened to me, my ABC block flew out the window, my favorite red ball bounced away, my rubber ducky stopped quacking, and with my doll baby, I no longer wanted to play. You see, everyone, I was so puzzled that I made the irreversible decision to climb inside of myself and hide for the rest of my days. First, I put on my fluffy pink slippers, then grabbed hold of my doll, threw my Mickey Mouse blanket over me, put my thumb in my mouth, and I have been gone for quite a while. That was over 50 years ago. You see, this is what happens to an innocent child. This is what happens when you molest a child. Anyways, you'll find some of us at the shelters, rehabs, and walking the streets, sitting on park benches, kicking up sand at the beach. Most likely, though, you'll find us running in and out of mental health facilities with our thumbs still in our mouth, and pink slippers still on our feet. Now close your eyes, everyone, and imagine someone snatching the cheer from under you, just as just as you were bending to take a seat. Mm -hmm. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Please come again. We'll be looking for you. We have everybody's email, I do believe. <laughs>